I shouldn't make movies anymore. Should go to a lunatic asylum <laughs> right away. This is Werner Herzog, a well-respected and possibly insane German filmmaker with a fierce rebellious streak and an undeniable flair for the strange and bizarre. And yes, he really did eat his own shoe. That's where our story will take us, but before we get there, some context on this shoe-eating director is required. If you're unfamiliar with Herzog's work and his colorful personality, you can find a more in-depth deep dive video I made on him several years ago at the top of the video here or in the description below. Herzog has directed over 40 films in his career, some of the most notable being Igire, The Wrath of God, Fitzcarraldo, and Nosferatu, The Vampire, as well as the documentaries Grizzly Man, Into the Inferno, and Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Aside from all of his superb work, Herzog is almost equally as famous for the eccentric stories and antics that have crafted the man into a sort of living, breathing myth. Besides eating his own shoe, here is a man who voluntarily leapt into a patch of cacti, who filmed a documentary on a volcano on the verge of eruption, who ran a rogue film school where most of the main lessons were in lockpicking and document forging, who randomly saved Joaquin Phoenix from a burning car wreck, who was once shot by an air rifle during an interview and continued the interview. Exactly what's that? I mean, that's a, that's a somebody sh shot at you and created a wound in your abdomen. It's not not significant. Without debate, Herzog is a film legend and a self-made one at that. Far from being the beneficiary of some Hollywood dynasty, Herzog came from very humble beginnings, and his early life did much to chisel him into the man who would one day eat his own shoe. He was born in 1942 in a small Bavarian village without a telephone, without a functioning toilet, and without running water. From early childhood, he'd been abandoned by his father and was mocked relentlessly by his peers and even his teachers. For the young Herzog, it must have seemed like he was engaged in direct conflict with the world conspiring against him, assuring he would be subjected to a life of misery. Then one day, at age 11, a traveling projectionist visited his town. It was the first time he experienced the moving image, and deep within him, a dream began to kindle. But he knew the indifferent world he inhabited would be of no help to him, and so he took the initiative and stole a camera from the Munich Film School with which he'd make his first films. Speaking on the incident in later years, Herzog said, quote, I had a natural right for a camera. Like a protagonist in one of his films, Herzog felt it was his duty to do all he could, irregardless of ethics, to force his dreams into fruition. A duty and a natural right to express himself and articulate his dreams. Thus, in his fiction films and documentaries, Herzog is consistently drawn to and expresses a degree of sympathy for a certain archetype of character. The dreamer, who charges fearlessly into the breach again and again to attempt the seemingly impossible against a violently indifferent world. For Herzog, if you have dreams, it is your utmost duty as a human being to strive towards achieving them, to articulate them. It is the only thing in his view that separates humans from farm animals. And if I abandon this project, I would be a man without dreams, and I don't want to live like that. I live my life or I end my life with this project. All these dreams are, are yours as well. And the only distinction between me and you is that I can articulate them. And that is what poetry or painting or literature or filmmaking is all about. And I, I make films because I have not learned anything else. And it is my duty. And we have to articulate ourselves, otherwise we would be cows in the field. In the quest to articulate your dreams, failure is not only to be anticipated, but expected. Despite how noble I've made him sound, failure is something Herzog has experienced and it's something he can easily tolerate. The great American film critic Roger Ebert once said of Herzog that even his failures are spectacular. The one trait, however, that the German filmmaker simply cannot and will not tolerate is cowardice. 
That brings us back in time to Berkeley, California, sometime during the mid-1970s. The location is a trendy local cinema, the Pacific Film Archive. There, among the scores of eccentric regulars, a promising young graduate student yet habitual slacker is regularly sneaking into daily showings. That young student's name is Errol Morris, and one day, Tom Luddy, the cinema's director, would introduce him to Werner Herzog. The two hit it off immediately, bonding over their mutual fascination in the strange and unusual, specifically in serial killers. Both men were particularly interested in Ed Gein, the infamous inspiration for Norman Bates, Buffalo Bill, and Leatherface, among others. Morris had spent a great deal of time in Gein's hometown of Plainfield, Wisconsin, where he rented the house next to Gein's and compiled hundreds of hours of interviews with Gein himself, with those who knew him, and with the strangely large number of serial killers that popped up in his microscopic hometown following his arrest. Morris spent over a year in Plainfield, all the while remaining clueless as to the direction of the work he was doing. At some point during his time there, he became fascinated with a theory that Gein had dug underground tunnels leading to his mother's grave. When he told Herzog about the theory, the German director immediately insisted that they go and test the theory out for themselves. When the day of exhumation came, Herzog arrived and patrolled the area for several hours, shovel in hand, waiting for Morris to show. But Morris would never show. Tom Luddy recalled that when the two men met, Werner was very taken with Errol. Despite Morris, at the time, never having shot a single foot of film, Werner, quote, treated him as an equal. It was clear to Werner that Morris was a very intelligent, ambitious, and capable individual. Yet he had a severe and very urgent problem. He could never finish anything he started. Morris spent his youth perpetually dabbling. He'd picked up both the cello and the typewriter, becoming proficient in both crafts, yet whenever push came to shove, Morris consistently crumbled under the shadow of resistance. By the time Morrill met Herzog, his obsessive film watching and weakness for academic detours had led to even the deterioration of his educational status. It didn't take long for Herzog's initial admiration of Morris to wear thin. Morris one day stumbled upon an intriguing article about pet cemeteries. He expressed interest in making a documentary about it. Predictably, however, Morris focused more on the reasons why he couldn't make his first film. His financial burdens and lack of financing made the project impossible. Although more than skeptical, Herzog wanted nothing more than for his friend to finally begin articulating his dreams. Sick of the excuses and cowardice, he gave Morris a sharp shove into the abyss and the spark of motivation he desperately needed to kickstart what would become an illustrious career. A career that otherwise may have been eternally imprisoned in the realm of potential, depriving millions of Morris's enriching documentaries. Among the parties involved, there is some disagreement about how the infamous shoe-eating bet was made. Recalling the moment in Les Blank's documentary aptly titled, Werner Herzog Eats His Shoe, Herzog claims to have said to Morris, You are a man who should make films, and you're going to do that film now. Money doesn't make films, you just have to do it and take the initiative. And I said I'm going to eat my shoes if you finish that one. Tom Luddy remembered the incident as more of a direct confrontation on Herzog's part where he taunted Morris for not having the guts to express himself and declaring that he would never get over the hump and actually make a film. According to Luddy's version of the events, Morris called him the very next day asking for a referral for a cameraman and got to work immediately on his debut film, Gates of Heaven. Morris himself claims to not have any recollection of the bet at all saying it was fabricated for publicity. Morris would later say in an interview, quote, I didn't make Gates of Heaven so that Werner Herzog would have to eat his shoe. It's not as if I decided to realize my potential as a human being in order to get someone to ingest something distasteful. I specifically asked Werner not to eat his shoe. Regardless of the bet's origins, Gates of Heaven was a spectacular triumph over resistance and procrastination. Although Morris wouldn't achieve commercial success until many years later, the critical acclaim his debut film received fueled him, and he never looked back. 
In turn, Morris's work has had an incalculably positive impact on many of those who've seen it. One of his documentaries even saved an innocent man from death row. Roger Ebert has cited Gates of Heaven as one of his favorite films, calling it a film that has engaged me as no other movie has in my years as a movie critic. He's also included it in his list of the 10 best films ever made. Despite the seductive story, however, it remains highly debatable whether or not Herzog truthfully deserves credit for the inception of Gates of Heaven and the career of Errol Morris. Personally, I think it's wise to assume that there is a bit of embellishment here on the part of Herzog. Ultimately, it is impossible for us to discern the facts of the situation, but the plain, mundane truth, what Herzog himself has negatively labeled the accountant's truth, is not something he's interested in. The story of Herzog eating his shoe ultimately fits into the paradigm of his own brand of truth, what he has labeled ecstatic truth, a blend of fact and fiction that he believes contains a truth that cuts far deeper than the dry accountant's truth. It's not easy to, to uh, get this across, what, what does it mean, ecstatic truth. There are deeper strata of truth, and you have to be inventive, and you have to fabricate. And, and you have to, to, to catch and try to find this elusive magic of, of images. I modify facts to such a degree that they resemble truth more than reality. In attempting to define his cryptic conception of this deeper ecstatic truth, Herzog has said, quote, it is mysterious and elusive and can only be reached through fabrication and imagination and stylization. In his hunt to capture this elusive truth in his work, Herzog has often blended fiction into the facts of his documentaries. For example, in his documentary Bells from the Deep, where he chronicles the strange beliefs of people living in the remote Russian tundra, he discovered a fascinating folk story of a city of angels lying at the bottom of a deep, frozen lake. We're shown the image of some townsfolk lying face first on the ice peering down to try to catch a glimpse of the angels below, injecting a sort of intuitive sense of awe to the story. However, the accountant's truth of the matter is that these men were drunks who were hired to lay down on the ice for the film. One of them even fell asleep with his face stuck to the ice. Responding to criticism of his cinematic trickery, Herzog defended himself by saying it, quote, is one of the most pronounced examples of what I mean when I say that only through invention and fabrication and staging can you reach a more intense level of truth that cannot otherwise be found. I took a fact that for many people this lake was the final resting place of a lost city and played with the truth of the situation to reach a more poetic understanding. According to Errol Morris's own word, it appears that a fair share of fiction was also incorporated into the tale behind Werner eating his shoe. But why? As Herzog states in the documentary, the spectacle has the outward motivation of seeking a distributor for Gates of Heaven. This is likely true, but there is a deeper truth to the spectacle, and for him, it is far more significant. Les Blank's documentary opens on a seemingly random note. Herzog ranting and expressing his disgust over commercials and talk shows and television programs like Bonanza. Despite the absurdity of it, Herzog quite seriously declares that there should be real war, a holy war, fought against such banal television programming. It's pretty on brand for Herzog's wackiness, but the crux of why he literally eats his shoe lies within it. We lack adequate images, Herzog bemoans towards the end of the documentary, and I think that our civilization is doomed and will die out like the dinosaurs if it doesn't have adequate images. If we don't develop an adequate language of images, our civilization will be, maybe even die out like the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. We must develop adequate uh, images when you look at, uh, on, at television or at much of what Hollywood does there is something uh, very unsatisfying and there is a deep gap between what is us and what these images are. Werner doesn't use the term war flippantly. For him the shallow reflection of humanity offered by TV and most of Hollywood is nothing short of an existential dilemma. 
They promote a humanity that is false, artificial, and ultimately pollutes the true essence of humanity and its inherent purity. Thus, when we consume this polluting content from the conveyor belt of television, and nowadays the internet and social media, we become more and more dissociated from who we truly are, what Herzog calls the inner chronicle of what we are. And this is the ecstatic reason why Werner Herzog ate his shoe. To create a somewhat absurd yet potent image armed with a message of encouragement and a call to action to everybody watching to fearlessly articulate their dreams, their deep inner voices, as Errol Morris did. To create a chain of inspiration that will lead to the forging of more adequate images, fighting back against the banal programming threatening to tarnish civilization. Considering how entrenched we have become in the inadequate, vapid images that Herzog opposes, his holy war has become exponentially harder to win, making his campaign all the more urgent. Werner Herzog is someone, however, who puts his money where his mouth is. He's dedicated his career and his life to crafting the adequate images he deems so necessary. Perhaps the most effective and memorable of Herzog's images comes from the film he made right after eating his own shoe, Fitzcarraldo. That image is this one, of a 320-ton steamship being hauled over a mountain. A feat that, amazingly and with great toil, was done completely practically. The goal of the film's protagonist is to reach an untouched area of jungle, harvest the untapped wealth of rubber trees, and use their sale to finance his impossible fanatical dream, to build an opera house in the Amazon. Similar to Herzog with his crusade against false imagery, Fitzcarraldo ultimately comes up short, yet he redeems a consolation in the end. Herzog's consolation is that while his voice will never be loud enough to silence the commercials and the talk shows, he and his images will consistently inspire the dreamers out there to assert themselves and their deep inner voices, thereby ensuring that adequate images will never go fully extinct.